but <clears throat> it's good to see you all again and, and share another study together t this evening. Um, the other day we started on lesson three and, and Bible study Sunday morning. And we kind of went over number one, but I kind of want to go back to number one on lesson three just because of our uh, lesson Sunday night since we kind of do further into into all that. So until that gets pulled up, let's just go back to 1 Corinthians 10, 13, if you have your Bibles out. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. <clears throat> and this is a very familiar text. We, we kind of went over this twice on Sunday, once in Bible study and then Sunday night for the lesson. So let's just go over it again and, and see what assurance we have concerning this. So it says in verse 13, No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. So what are some forms of temptation that we can see in today's world? Gossip. What was that? I'm sorry. Gossip. Go gossip? No way. That's not true. Gossip? We, we know a lot about gossip. The internet's a large temptation for our young, especially. The internet. Um, whatever you see on there, some of the stuff that people say about others, it kind of gets you tempted, right? When you see something you don't agree with, or you see some somebody being mean to somebody else, it kind of makes you want to get in on, on the action, right? What, what else do we see today? Those are two really good examples. Obviously, those are huge problems in today's world, but what kind of other temptation might, might we see? Honestly, this may sound dumb, but like... No, not coming from you. <laughs> <laughs> like, making your schedule so hectic that you're just downright exhausted, and you it's really tempting to choose to stay home and sleep instead of coming to services. Right, so sometimes we put our, so much of our energy toward earthly things that sometimes it can interfere with our, with our spiritual walk. And that was something I started learning about in college. And when I was in high school, and, and I'm sure those of you who have played sports in here, both present and and past know about this, but when you go to school, and then if you're playing a sport and you go right to practice, what are you going to want to do immediately after practice? Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. Right? And I tell you what, Wednesdays for me as a high school kid were the hardest. And I, I will fully admit that to every single one of you because whether it was, you know, when you're going to school, facing some things you saw in school and then going and, and hitting full pads and practice for three hours, it, it took a lot out of you. And and that was something that I learned, you know, later on in my senior year, I was like, man, I gotta make some changes. And so I'm glad you said that because that was a huge problem with me growing up and that's a huge problem for a lot of people today. You know, they give so much energy toward earthly things that sometimes it puts God on hold. And obviously you never mean to put God on hold, but sometimes it happens because you're just running out of energy. And so that are, those are some types of, of temptation that we see in today's world. And obviously it's a huge problem. We can, we can see it every single day in our lives. I mean, it, it's all around us. All you have to do is, is, is go on Facebook and, and you see debates well, not really debates, but more of arguing about debates. And, and, and that's all you see is just negativity. That's all you have to do is just search on the internet. And so we see it all around us, and that's why we need to make sure temptation isn't something new. God is faithful, and he won't give you what you can't handle. And that's something we can all look to for, for guidance and some type of Positivity and all the negativity that we see in today's world. 
Anything else before we move on to another text? Any questions, comments, anything? All right, if you would, let's turn to John 15, 7. We'll go ahead and move on from that. John 15, 7. So it says verse 7 in, in, this, in this piece of paper that is behind me. But let's go all the way back to verse 1. And this is Jesus talking and his importance in our role. And this is what he mentioned starting in verse 1 of chapter 15 of John. It says in verse 1, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. What's he, what's he talking about here so far in the first couple of verses? What's Jesus talking about? Is he talking about us? He is, because he says, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, what does he do? He takes it away. He takes it away. Right? Those are, who, who might we consider those people to be? Those are the spiritually lost. That's who he's talking about right here. When he says, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. Those he is talking about here are the unfaithful. So let's keep reading. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. It says in verse 3, already you are clean. Because of the word that I have spoken to you, abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. What, it, what does he say right there? What does that mean? Can't bear fruit by itself, but by the vine. Who's, who's the vine? It's Jesus. It's Jesus. Jesus is the vine, God's the vine dresser. And so what is he saying about us? As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself, what does that say about man? We can't do it without him. We can't do it without going through Jesus. That is what he's saying here in these verses. He's saying man cannot live spiritually without him. We have to go through Jesus. And that's what he's talking about here. And so I, I lost my place. Okay, verse 4. Or no, verse 5. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me, and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, what can you do? Nothing. Nothing. Right? That's what he's saying. He's... So what's he talking about there? What's the fire? Hell. Hell. Right? The eternal fire right there. That's what he's saying. He said, if anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch. And they are thrown into the fire and burned. In verse 7, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. So I kind of wanted to give a whole backstory about this, right? We see verses, verse 7 in this text, but I kind of wanted to give the entire, the entire scene here because it's really important for our daily walk because he mentions, you know, he doesn't beat around the bush. He's saying, listen, you're not going to be saved without going through me. You have to go through me to be saved. So in A, why are we able to ask God anything? What we just read about in verse verse seven, if we abide in Him, He will abide in us, and our prayers will be answered. 
Right. So if we abide in Him and He in us, our prayers will be answered. But here's what I... <clears throat> so I was doing this study a few weeks ago. And what, when I was doing this at another congregation, I made the mistake of... I was like, hey, you can ask whatever and it'll be done. What is he talking about when it says ask whatever? It has to be according to his will. And also typically the prayers of Christians are answered. But there are cases in the Bible where somebody was seeking God. Like Cornelius. He was his prayers went up to God when he was not yet a Christian. He was striving to reach up and know God. And that's why God put Peter in his life. Which that's what we call referred to as the first non-circumcised uh, proselyte uh, because there were proselytes on the day of Pentecost. So, uh, they were uh, Jewish. They were non-Jewish Gentiles. They converted to Jew Jewish religion. But we know that typically the Bible says that if one turns his ear away from the very law, it's not just that God doesn't do <coughs> his prayer, but it says his prayer is an abomination of God in Proverbs. But somebody seeking after God, now I'm confident that after Peter came to Cornelius in Acts chapter 10, 47, after the Holy Spirit fell off on the Gentiles there also, uh, he commanded them, he said, Come any man for red water, and he's going to be baptized. And then he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord, totally consistent with Matthew chapter 28, before Jesus sent him back to heaven, you know, told him to baptize in the name of the Father. The Son of the Holy Spirit. But at that point, Cornelius would have rejected the word, then God would have hear his prayers anymore. So people can pray all day, but they're not in this type of relationship by being baptized into Christ. That's how we abide in Christ. He abides in us through the word. The fruit of the Spirit, which is mentioned in Galatians, as the word gets in you, and you put those attributes in, that the Spirit is the Spirit of Christ for one. Then you bear that fruit, it flows out of that heart. So all these things come together in our mind to kind of conclude where we have to be in standing with God in order for Him to hear our prayer. That's a long answer. But that, that's, that's I mean, you were spot on. I mean, when it comes to our spiritual needs, right, and the way that we act as Christians every day, right, He's going to see where our heart is when we pray and, and that abiding in Him. So I can abide in God, but. That, that, that means that he'll abide in me, and if I ask for a permanent ESPN Plus subscription, I'm sure he can give it to me, right? I mean, trust me, it would be nice, but but that's not that's not the point here. You know, you can't ask for anything, and, and that's why I really appreciated Solomon. So if you would, let's go to 1 Kings chapter 3, and let's see what Solomon asked for when he has the opportunity in 1 Kings 3. 1 Kings chapter 3, starting in verse 1. <clears throat> so when we do something like this, we have to be careful. And Solomon is very careful in his prayer. And, it, and what he asks for really pleases God. And it says in verse 1, Solomon made a marriage alliance with Pharaoh, with Pharaoh king of Egypt, and he took Pharaoh's daughter and brought her into the city of David until he finished building his house. So who's David to Solomon? That's his father. So obviously, you know, him being brought up by King David, he's going to have a lot of morals here. And that's, that's what we're about to find out in, in his prayer and what he asked for. And the house of the Lord and the wall around Jerusalem. And in verse 2, the people were sacrificing at the high places. However, because no house had yet been built for the name of the Lord, Solomon loved the Lord, walking in statutes of David his father, only he sacrificed and made offerings at the high places. And the king, verse 4, went to Gibeon to a sacrifice there. For that was the great high place. Solomon used to offer a thousand burnt offerings on that altar. At Gideon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night. And God said, Ask what I shall give you. And Solomon said, You have shown great and steadfast love to your servant David, my father, because he walked before you in faithfulness and righteousness, 
and an uprightness of heart toward you. And you have kept for him this great and steadfast love and given him a son to sit on his throne this day. And now, O Lord, my God, you have made your servant king in place of David, my father, although I am but a little child. I do not have, know how to go out or come in. And your servant is in the midst of your people, whom you have chosen a great people, too many to be numbered or counted for multitude. And in verse 9, give your servant therefore an understanding, mine, to govern your people, that I may discern between good and evil. For who is able to, to govern this your great people? It pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this. And God said to him, Because you have asked this, and have not asked for yourself long life or riches or the life of your enemies, but have asked for yourself understanding to discern what is right, behold, I now do according to your word. Behold, I give you a wise and discerning mind, so that none like you has been before you, and none like you shall arise after you. I give you also what you have not asked, both riches and honor, so that no other king shall compare with you all your days. And if you will walk in my ways, keeping my statutes and my commandments, as your father David walked, then I will lengthen your days. So what is the lesson we can learn here in this text right here? What, is, what does God say that he's glad Solomon didn't ask for? Riches and life. Riches and long life. So that's kind of why I wanted to read that text is because we still have to be careful, right? He was given the option here to ask whatever. And so God was pleased because he didn't ask for the life of his enemies, riches. He wasn't doing it in a selfish way. He was asking for wisdom, right? To discern between good and evil. He was using it and using this in a smart way, and it did what to God? It pleased him. And so that's why I wanted to put that text in there, because, you know, we can ask God anything, right, if we abide in him and his words abide in us, but we have to be careful and not do that for selfish reasons. And we see an example in the scripture of somebody who did that in a smart way and pleased God because of it. Any questions, comments, anything before we move on? <clears throat> All right, let's go to James 5. James 5, 16. says in James 5, 16, Therefore confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The power or the prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. So in this text, we kind of go to the next question here. What promise do we have concerning effectual prayer? Right, so we see in verse 16, this is another example of, of when you confess your sins and pray for one another. Does that say pray for, I mean, obviously we can pray for ourselves, right? But the, the point of this is not to be, it, it's to pray for one another that you may be what? Heal. Heal. And, the, and the prayer of a, what kind of person has great power? A righteous, a righteous person. So we have that promise concerning effectual prayer. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. <clears throat> and so I want Moses in the Old Testament. God was ready to destroy the Jewish people because of disobedience. It started over. But Moses went to God on behalf of the Israelites. You think about the implications of that. He spared the nation of people. Not that he didn't destroy a lot of them. He destroyed 20 in one day, but he, he, he 
basically uh, was the Messiah was going to come through the uh, Israelites, the Jewish people. But uh, there's an example of the Old Testament. You know, we also know that Paul was a righteous man. He, pray, he did pray on behalf of the, what his infirmity the flesh was, and that wasn't according to God's will. So even if we do have something maybe even necessary to consider it selfish, it might be relieved from some kind of a physical issue. And it doesn't necessarily get answered the way that we thought. That's not a reason to give up. We know Paul was the right to send him once he was converted to Christ. And yet he thought that my grace is sufficient to do this. So all these things when prayers are answered or maybe not answered the way we think they should be, has to be tempered with these other insights that we have from the scripture. Right. And I'm glad you brought that up because when it talks about the prayer of the righteous person, does that does that consider those people who want their prayers answered immediately every single time? Because have you seen people like that? Like, I've had people approach me in the past saying, why wasn't this answer for me? Why wasn't this answer right away? You know, I prayed last night and it's 7 o'clock in the morning, but I haven't seen it yet. Right? Not everything is going to happen the way we think it might happen immediately. But what did we learn about God being in 1 Corinthians 10, 13? God is always faithful to us, right? So we might not get our answers immediately, but that doesn't mean he's not working. He obviously knows what's best for us in that moment or future moments, whatever it may be. No matter what, God is always faithful to us. So we have to trust him. That's a good point there. Thanks for uh, bringing that up. Anything else before we move on? All right, we're going to backtrack a little bit in the New Testament and go all the way back to Matthew. Matthew chapter 7. We're going to start in verse 7. <clears throat> and this is going to bring us to our next question and number 3. So in this text, Matthew 7, 7 through 8. It says, starting in verse 7, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. And the one who seeks, finds. And the one who knocks, it will be opened. So who's talking in this text right here? Jesus. Jesus, right? Jesus is talking here and he's giving us some good advice in this text. Ask and it will be what? Right. Seek and you will... Fine. Don't we sing a song about this sometimes? Doesn't this all sound familiar right here? Knock, and it will be open to you. <clears throat> Would we... What This sounds like... When he's discussing this stuff, you know, ask, seek, knock, these are... Christians, and, and you mentioned this earlier, who are ultimately continuing to work for that goal, right? These are, this is talking about how faithful we can be, right? We have to, let's just, we have to continue to ask, right? We might not have the answers immediately, so let's ask, right? Ask about it. Try to get some answers about what's in the text, what we can do, how we can live according to what he would want us to do. Seek. What does he mean by seek? What are we supposed to seek? His word. His word. Search the scriptures. Make sure you're looking at it because listen, and I said this earlier, when, and what I appreciate most about God and the scriptures is that he never beats around the bush. Right? He tells us exactly in scripture what he wants us to do. And so... Right, it's, you know, sometimes 
and I said this earlier, but a lot of times when I was younger, I, I'm sure he's listening right now, but when I was younger and my dad said, said, you better do what I ask. And I was like, what's gonna happen if I don't? And he'll just say, well, we'll see. I hated that answer more than anything because I knew we'll see meant I was getting the belt. Now, I, my brother and I never got the belt, my sisters did. But, right, I always hated that answer because that to me scared me the most as a kid was not knowing what my dad was going to do next when, when I did something I wasn't supposed to do, which wasn't very much. Right, I was, I was, the, I was the poster child of my family. So, what, that's what we can appreciate about God is that no matter what, we have the answers. Anything we ask, anything we're trying to find, we can find it in the Scripture. And if we're not going to do that, those consequences are given to us as well. And so, you know, He gets right to the point about anything that we need in this life. He gives us everything we need, and He tells us exactly what to do, how to get there, and ultimately gives us a map, right, on how we can get to heaven, and that's through Jesus. Second Peter, I think it's chapter 3, verse 1, somewhere along there, it says, according to His divine power, He's given us all things that pertain to life and the godliness, how to acknowledge him and all the glory and virtue. So that covers everything. He's given us all things that pertain to while we exist in these earthly bodies, okay, the life and godliness. So kind of goes along with what Solomon asked for. He asked for wisdom, which is the ability to live skillfully. But if I'm wanting wisdom to ever open the word, it's not going to be imparted like the spiritual gifts in what First Corinthians there that those people had. For today, we study to get knowledge, we pray to get wisdom. Because that's the way I understand. And this is part of that seeking. Part of seeking would be having that desire, to part of that hunger and thirst after righteousness. But like I said, our part is to read the revealed word and with the right part that insight into what these things Right, and no matter how hard life gets for us, we always can look back and say, no matter what happens, if we follow God's word, instantly we got everything we needed when Jesus died for us. <coughs> because that gave us hope. Right, and because of that hope, all we need to do is follow his instructions that are given to us. And because of that hope that Jesus provided by dying for us, we always have something to look forward to. We just have to make sure that our heart's in the right place when we're going along the way. <coughs> Sam shared a wonderful poem on Facebook the other day, and I noticed throughout that poem that as that person was talking to himself, basically, he kept saying, and I, I began to make another excuse, I began to make another excuse. He knew it was an excuse when he was making it. And he knew enough about the word, basically, to know the excuse was not going to work. Yeah. And I think we as Christians, that's why we study to show ourselves the truth. These excuses are not going to work in the end. We may do it. We may decide to do the wrong thing. But in the end, we may accept that judgment. Right. These excuses are not going to work. And I'm sure I would have seen it, but I had to mute her because of all the posts I see every day. No, I'm just kidding. But yeah, the, those excuses, no matter what we say, are not going to matter in the day of judgment. And that's what we have to be careful of too, because we know that every action we have is consequence, has consequences to it, and God's going to know our heart before we even start to utter that excuse. Right? So that's what we have to be careful of is those excuses are not going to matter. That's another thing that's difficult. Like, if we do something like one of our kids does something or when we were kids, did something, our consequence was then. You know what I mean? We're like, ooh, I'm not going to do that again. You're not the only one about that. No, I got it too. So, but our consequence from God, you know, if we live a long life, it's going to be a long time.
time for now, and it's very easy to, uh, nothing's really happening, I'm just going to push that aside, I'm just going to keep going, you know. So it, it's very important to always keep in the back of your mind, there is a consequence, and it's way worse than the belt, you know. But it's very easy to not even think about it when you haven't even experienced that consequence yet, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> you make a lot of good points there. It, it's, it can be easier as a kid to sin knowing your consequences. As a kid, you, you're thinking you're living forever, right? I'm a kid, nothing's going to happen to me now, but, but you know, if I did something to one of my siblings or did something my parents didn't agree with, I was scared to death because I knew consequences were about to happen immediately. And that's what a lot of people throughout high school, college, wherever you, you see it all the time, like they would tell me, they're like, <clears throat> and, and these, these are true stories. Like I, I'm not making this up right now. I, I've heard it many times, people saying, well, nothing's gonna happen to me right now, right? When I get older, I'll just confess my sins about this and I'll be fine. Well, that doesn't really work when tomorrow's not guaranteed. Right, and, and I'm sure, <clears throat> I don't want to say this, but it has to be said, I have lost numerous friends before the age of 21 who thought they were going to live forever, thought they were going to live longer than they were, and sometimes, like we said, tomorrow's not guaranteed, and life had different outcomes of mine. It, so that's why we need to be careful is because the day of judgment could come any time. What does the Bible say? Like what? In the night. Like a thief in the night, Jesus is going to come. We don't know when it's going to be. So even if, even if nothing happens to us in this world, you never know when that day of judgment is going to be. So I can't sit here and say I can do whatever I want because I'm only 25 years old. And I'm, I still got 50 more years left, maybe. I, I can't say that stuff because I don't know what tomorrow brings. So that's why we have to be careful. And, and it, is, it is easy to get caught up in that when you say there might be consequences now. So I don't want to do that. But if, if I die, those consequences might be later. You know, I, and I've been, I've had that. I used to do that when I was younger, but after learning from my parents, you know, the lessons they taught me and learning about lessons throughout the years from Brian or just anywhere I went, it made me realize tomorrow really isn't guaranteed. Back in Proverbs, it says, he that is often reproved and pardoned this now <coughs> shall suddenly be destroyed without remedy. We don't know when that time's going to come, so we have the reproof, we have the word of God instead of a bad suppress it. And it says we can be cut off without remedy. So if we die in that condition, obviously that could be at least one example of where it's no longer fixed. What about what about when the world was destroyed the first time? Do you think any of those people thought that was going to happen? I, I'm sure there would have been plenty more people on that ark if that was the case. But why was there so few people on that ark? It's not going to happen, no. Why are you doing that? Look how doubted he was when he was building that. People thought, you know, look, look at him over there. Well, it took him 100 years. They probably got tired of waiting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, you know, I'm sure, I'm sure nobody, you know, all of them, they were in doubt. They didn't think that was going to happen. And what did God decide to do? He really did start over. Right? He destroyed everything by water. And so those people didn't think that was going to happen. Sometimes things in life get in the way of, of what we expect to happen. So let's just be prepared in case that does that happen. So let's go to 3A. It looks like we're getting short on time. So what happens when you ask, see, knock? What does the text say in Matthew 7? Ask and it, it will be given, seek, 
Find, knock. Right. So let's go to Deuteronomy 4.29 for the last few minutes. I don't think we're going to get through all of this. But Deuteronomy 4.29. It says in verse 29 of Deuteronomy 4, For from there you will seek the Lord your God, and you will find him, if you search after him with all your heart and with all your soul. So what do we have to do to find him? How much effort do we have to do? Right, we have to, we have to do what? I'm sorry, actively seek him. We have to actively seek him. How? Like half effort or everything, everything. with everything you have, right? It says, seek him with all of your heart and with all of your soul. You know, I, I bring this sports reference a lot, but every person that starts the season is trying to win a championship, right? That's the goal you set when you first start the season. I'm <coughs> I'm going to seek that state title. For college, I'm going to seek that national title. What do you have to do in order to receive that? Practice. You have to practice. You have to give it your all. You don't give it your all, you're not going to find it. Right? You're not going to have it. You have to give anything and everything if you really want that state title. That trophy, no matter what you're seeking. And that's kind of like the same thing here. When you try to seek the Lord your God, you have to use everything in your being to do it. You can't do it half-heartedly. You have to do it with everything in you. So in B, in the first part of B, in what way should we seek the Lord? When we're seeking the Lord, how should we do it? With all our heart and soul. With With all our heart and soul. Everything in us. There's people who demonstrate a limited limit faith. Felix trembled when Paul talked to him about righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come. But then he said the word some will be king today. And then he said that also hope that Paul would give him money. So he obviously you don't tremble about something unless you have a certain level of belief in it, which is what Felix demonstrated, but he had other fishing fry, so to speak. So he thought he could kick the can down the road, like we talk about, but there's no indication that Felix ever obeyed the gospel. And right now, he's in the ADM world, and he wishes he would have uh, jumped on that opportunity when he had it. Because now those things that he had his focus on, are, they don't mean anything. But, but he's the one that heard the word. Now he realizes what he missed. Right, and <clears throat> I want to ask you all a question. I want to know if you all have heard the saying before. Have you ever had a parent or guardian tell you, we go in here, you better be on your best behavior? How many of you have heard that? How many of you have heard it? If, if you act really good here, we might get some ice cream after this. Well, any time my brother and I went somewhere, for some reason the girls never got to talk. But, you know, every time we went somewhere, my mom was always telling us, you two better be on your best behavior. I know how you two are. And so, what did we have to do? Does that mean that, you know, half the time I was good and half the time I was, you know, gut punching my brother? What did I have to do that whole time? I had to behave myself that whole entire time in order to receive maybe some cookies and cream McFlurries from McDonald's if the ice cream machine was actually working. Right? You know, sometimes when that stuff happened, she was constantly watching us to make sure that every single moment, in order for us to receive that reward, we were on our best behavior. Isn't that kind of a... Mm, 
Wow, that, that was my worst enemy. But that was, that was just my point there is, shouldn't we do the same thing with God? Because that's what He expects for us as His children. Always be on your best behavior. Always seek Him with all your heart and with all your soul. I appreciate you all for the lesson. I look forward, Lord willing, to another study Sunday morning.